Hey everyone, my new Minute here, coming at you guys with a video response to Bearded and Cole's comic cover challenge. So for those of you guys unfamiliar, which I'm sure all of you are probably familiar, but uh, Bearded and Cole do a monthly cover challenge. This month it was villains and I thought, that's perfect. I can totally do that with my big Batman comic book collection. If there's one thing Batman's got, it's great villains and great covers to go with those villains. Now to be honest, I'm doing way more than 10 comics. I couldn't even begin to narrow it down, so I didn't even try. Um, so you're getting like a triple response maybe? The way I went about this was I thought about what are some of my favorite Batman villains and tried to match up a great cover for each of those various villains. But then there were a couple villains I literally couldn't decide. So towards the end, there are two villains that are each getting five covers apiece. All right, of course, on Judd Winnick's run on Batman, he famously brought Jason Todd back from the dead, during which he became the villain Red Hood. Now, obviously, he's bounced back and forth. He's more of an anti-hero nowadays. But I wanted to give Jason Todd his due as a true villain. And so I thought, what is the most nefarious he ever was? And I thought that Nightwing one year later, with this cover by Jock, uh, basically this takes place in New York City when Nightwing's in New York City. Jason Todd follows him there and starts committing crimes as Nightwing. And even though you barely see Jason Todd, it's just literally his hand and that curved knife that he used to use. When he first showed up back on the scene, this curved knife was synonymous with Jason Todd. And I'll never forget seeing this cover and knowing that this issue is an absolute must buy, despite the fact that there's actually very little graphically going on here. It tells a whole story because you got Lady Liberty in the background, you've got the knife in the foreground, and you've got that Nightwing stripe. And it tells you everything you need to know about the comic book, especially if you're reading at the time. So I just think this is a great piece of cover art, in addition to being a great representation of just how evil Jason Todd could be. All right, next up is one I got to take out of the poly bag. Um, I wanted to get a really good Bane comic in here. And, you know, obviously there's some pretty iconic Bane comic books out there. Of course, there's always the breaking of the bat, such a famous cover. I actually don't like that cover. Um, I always felt like it was a little bit toothless. There's sort of this splat that looks like it should be bloody, but it's just kind of like blacked out by the inker. It just, something about it doesn't rub me right. Part of it is I'm not a huge Kelly Jones fan either, so maybe that's part of it. Um, so then I was just kind of going through the collection thinking, well, what are some great... Bane covers, and I found a whole stack of them, and I decided to go Cult of the New. As much as this storyline is controversial, you got to admit, Batman 82 from Volume 3, which was all about the city of Bane, went for an absolutely killer Bane cover. You literally have him on the cover the size of Godzilla, just stomping the city, big explosions everywhere, and then if you open it up, you get the wonderful spoiler that perhaps Thomas Wayne is actually behind it all. And just another great cover that does a lot to sort of tell the story that's inside the book. This 90s iteration of the character isn't necessarily my favorite. I thought that overall this cover is too awesome not to show. And so for Mr. Freeze, I went with sort of the more Arnold Schwarzenegger era Mr. Freeze. This is Batman Legends of the Dark Knight 121 with this awesome painted cover with Batman in great peril, a wonderful ice castle in the background. This is of course a No Man's Land tie-in, lots of great covers from that era, and not the only No Man's Land title you're going to see today. Alright, my next couple of covers are kind of cult of the new. Uh, you've seen them recently, so I won't dwell on them for too long. First up, I'm going to show off my favorite Penguin cover, at least for the time being, and that is going to be from Detective Comics 1053. Penguin's had many, many great covers over the years, but this is one that's really stuck in my head since I picked it up. We'll see if, you know, time makes me regret this choice, but I'm going to stick with it. I did want to give Jorge Jimenez a shout out as his work on Batman has been absolutely stellar, and I really enjoyed the way he reinvented the Scarecrow. This is Batman issue 107 from volume 3. This is not my favorite arc. This is not my favorite take on the Scarecrow. I think he was super underutilized in Fear State, but it doesn't change the fact that this sort of Wicker Man version of Scarecrow is pretty dope, and I think that this is a great representation of him on a cover. 
Now, this is where we get into kind of a short honorable mention. I just had to show this one off and I'm probably gonna get flack for it down in the comments because Scarecrow isn't actually even on this cover, but it's a Matt Wagner shout out from his run on the covers of Batman. This is issue 630 and it's Batman at the end of a knockdown drag out brawl with Scarecrow and you see hay just like everywhere and Batman in tatters. The implication of Scarecrow here is as good as having Scarecrow on the cover, so if I could pick this one, this would actually be the one. But of the almost no rules that Bearded and Cole have set up for this challenge, it has to have a villain on the cover. That is one of the rules. So consider this book not shown. You never saw it. You didn't hear it from me. All right, continuing on our merry way, we will skip ahead to a series where I've literally had like five or six books selected from this series. You will definitely see it again. So I decided to go with Gotham City Sirens issue six for my Poison Ivy choice. This is just a smoking hot cover. So I mean, I don't think you guys would begrudge me this particular choice. Um, Gotham City Sirens, the Hush storyline, um, all the jock covers from Detective Comics, a whole slew of Lee Bermejo covers. Like you could literally do Batman villains by artist and still easily come up with 10 covers. So I'm trying to keep it varied. We went with Gotham City Sirens for this particular character. All right, next up, I had to throw on some Ra's al Ghul, and especially with the very recent passing of the great Neil Adams, I had to give him a shout out. And I decided to do so with Batman issue 244. Um, this is probably my favorite Ra's al Ghul cover, maybe because it reminds me of the Batman Hush cover actually in some weird way. Obviously it's quite a bit different than that cover, but for some reason I connect the two in my mind. Uh, my first encounters with Ra's al Ghul were in Batman Hush before I read the Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams stuff. So in a weird way a book from, you know, 20-30 years in the future gave me nostalgia when I looked at a book that was significantly further in the past. But nevertheless, awesome pulpy cover from Neil Adams here with Batman 244. All right now where the demon's head is the daughter can't be far behind we're gonna go back to Gotham City Sirens which we just left skipping ahead to issue 16 this time for probably my favorite Talia Al Ghul cover of all time. I don't even have to think about it I always imagine this. Another smoky Hot cover from uh, Gilla March and just the composure of this shot with the mirror, the sword, the double, triple reflections. It's just a wonderfully composed cover with some great penciling, inking, and coloring bringing the whole picture together. All right, next up we're gonna go back to Legends of the Dark Knight. This is issue 119. This is another one where I just always think of it. Like, it's one of those covers that just always pops into my brain when I think about great Batman covers. You've got, you know, Two-Face looking himself in the mirror, and then you've got Gordon and Batman, two halves of his brain, looking back at him in his reflection. Just a really psychological, interesting cover. Brian Boland, of course, has done many, many great Batman covers, The Killing Joke not least among them. But this is just one that's very clever, very unique. Uh, kind of dovetails nicely from the Talia one with mirrors. So maybe I just kind of have a soft spot for that because we have another mirror cover coming up there actually in just a minute. Now the one thing about this one that made me question whether I should make it the number one choice is obviously you don't see all of Two-Face. So I am going to show my runner up for this one which is actually the Batman 66 one-shot Lost episode adaptation which was Harlan Ellison's episode that he wrote for the would have been season four of the 66 TV show featuring a very very cool take on Two-Face whether you're a fan of the Adam West or you think it's annoying or whatever it is you can't really deny this is a pretty epic Alex Ross interpretation of a 60s Two-Face that you could plop on a cover right now, say it's modern, and you probably wouldn't even question it. This is one of my all-time favorite Batman covers of all time, probably top five. Just one that when I saw it, I instantly fell in love with it. This is actually a 619 reprint, which I'm sure as you all know, 619 is the final issue of Hush, in which you found out the Riddler did it. And since this was a reprint, they were able to put Riddler front and center on the cover of this. 
and what a great concept for a cover here. So you've got Riddler playing chess with all the various Batman villains. Batman is a pawn on the board as well. And even though this is not Riddler related, my favorite part of this cover is the Joker, who, I don't know how you'll be able to read this, but he's wearing a shirt that says, I killed Jason Todd and all I got was this lousy t-shirt, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Great Jim Lee cover. Bringing Riddler back as a major villain after Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale had really kind of thrown him in the dumpster over the course of the long Halloween and dark victory. Like, he was very much washed up, and it was cool to see them kind of course correct and bring him back to form in a classic Riddler style that I don't know they've really successfully capitalized on since, to be honest. Catwoman just happens to be one of, if not my favorite, Batman villain. Of course, she's not really a villain anymore, but I'm still counting her among the rogues gallery. Even as a hero, she firmly has one foot planted in that past anyway. So this is one I had to say F it. I'm just gonna pick five different covers, so I'm gonna go through them fairly quick for you guys because I don't want this video to get crazy long, but I really do think it's worth it to just kind of go through various iterations of her over the years. So first up, we're gonna go back to the Bronze Age, Batman 355. The Bat and the Cat, with the classic purple skirt and green cape. The Bat and the Cat, you've got their animal versions of themselves sort of dueling in the shadows in the background. I just think the composure of this cover is cool and a great representation of sort of that classic era Catwoman for sure. Next up, we're going to skip all the way up to 2002. Um, I was debating about whether I do the first issue or the second issue, but I opted for the second issue because this is the one she has the mask on for, and that is. Catwoman number two. This is the Ed Brubaker and Darwin Cook run. Absolutely love Darwin Cook's work on anything DC Comics he did and obviously many other great things. I'm a huge fan of his Parker books. Had to give him some representation in here as one of the great Catwoman illustrators as well. Skipping ahead to the <laughs> Cheesecake Factory again. We got Gillum March. This time it's Catwoman number one from the DC Comics New 52 era. Um... I think this cover speaks for itself. It's cheesecake, it's delightful, it was controversial at the time, but you know what? That just makes me remember it that much more. Fourth Catwoman cover, I know it's getting ridiculous, we're almost there. We've got Catwoman 30 from the Ram V Fernando Blanco run. I thought that this was just a really cool cover right off the top. Another one you've seen recently, so I won't dwell on it. I just love the attitude in this cover and her kind of designer vinyl coat is just pretty spectacular and reminds me of Batman 1989. Which leads me to the last Catwoman cover, which is brand new off the shelves, Batman 89, five of six. Um, one of the great interpretations of Catwoman is in Batman Returns, and what better representation of it than on this cover. We are almost there. If you have made it this far, leave a comment down below. So now there's obviously one really major villain we haven't talked about, but before we get to that one, we gotta talk about his girlfriends. So our last mirror cover in this challenge is gonna go to punchline number one, in which you have her looking at herself in the mirror, in which she's punchline or possibly just an innocent young woman. Obviously she is basically Helen Carnet, one of the most evil people to ever live, and this comic book sort of misrepresents it, but it doesn't mean it's not a really cool cover. Now I've said it before and I'll say it again, I really like Punchline, but you're never gonna beat the original girlfriend of the Joker in Harley Quinn. Now obviously there's the classic Harley Quinn look that, you know, can't be understated how cool that is, but I do think Amanda Connor does the definitive Harley Quinn, even if it's in the sort of roller derby era of Harley Quinn. I poured through the covers that I had from Harley Quinn and I decided, you know what, Harley Quinn number nine, Harley in handcuffs, winging at the reader, is probably the sassiest one and my favorite. All right, so we are nearing the end. Uh, we've got to take a look at Mr. J himself. And this was so, so hard to pick. And I didn't want to just pick the obvious, I wanted to throw a couple fun ones in there. So we're going with five again. Uh, I'm going to go with sort of the no-brainers probably first, and then we'll go to the ones that I think just deserve more attention. It's not necessarily that they beat the other ones, it's just that they get overshadowed and I want to give them the spotlight today. 
So kicking things off, we'll go with the Gabriel Del Auto variant for the Joker 80th anniversary issue. Um, just one of the most incredible Joker covers I've seen in recent years. And it really captures that 90s aesthetic with just the Joker in the rain, insane clown vibe. Just feels so 90s. It just takes me back and I think it's an incredible cover. Now if I'm trying to pick probably my definitive Joker cover, I guess it would have to go to Jim Lee's Hush storyline. I always thought that this cover was incredible. Another one where it's like the cover just tells the story of what is in the book. Um, I think this is a great representation of the character not just because Jim Lee draws a great Joker but because he wants Batman to kill him and he takes manic pleasure in messing with Batman psychologically and all of that is represented on this cover as illustrated by Jim Lee which is why I think it's probably the definitive Joker of all time but it's also I'm gonna get in trouble for this but it's played out a little bit. You know, this is the definitive Joker, and but it's also the one that everyone has copied ever since. Uh, Jim Lee kind of like closed the book on the Joker, and then you always get these sort of manic Jokers. Uh, this is one I thought about showing, the lenticular Batman, was this 23.1, that's right, um, which is an awesome cover. And I like Jason Fabok, but it sort of feels like Jim Lee light, and so it just doesn't quite hold up. And so that's the purpose of showing these last three covers, just showing that there is another side to the Joker, and I think it would be great to vary up the storytelling more with him than we're currently doing, because he's definitely at risk right now of kind of being played out. So the first one I have to shout out is another Jock cover, and that's Detective Comics 880. Um, just an incredible cover from an incredible series of covers. Um, probably my favorite from this run is actually Batman wearing the gas mask, uh, which was Batman 571 or 572 maybe, something like that. Um, but of course that's not a villain cover, we gotta show villain covers, and this is an absolute treat. Jock is one of my all-time favorite artists, period, and his Batman stuff is no small part of why that is. Alright, next up we're gonna go back in time to a little bit more of a stately Joker, and I think the reason I picked this cover is because of the attitude. It's done by Mike Mignola, it's Batman 429, the conclusion of the death in the family storyline. And what's great about this is, you know, he's committed this atrocity, right? And the final cover isn't him cackling like a madman. You know, it's him with the monocle, statesman, diplomatic immunity, all that sort of subplot, which I don't know, I'm a little bit mixed on that subplot to be completely honest, I feel like that's a little silly, but I did like the idea of Joker as a statesman sort of choosing to class himself up a bit, I think is really provocative. All four of the covers of this storyline are pretty amazing because they're so minimalist and so effective, but I had to give this Joker a shout out. Of course, Mike Mignola, another person who has just done some incredible Batman work and you almost can't not show one of his covers. So then that just leaves one more. So what did I go with? So this is Michael Lark's interpretation of the Joker. And I think this one might get some side glances, but again, this is an alternate take on the Joker. It's much more in tone with the silent man who laughs for which the Joker was based on. But it also has this wonderful crime pulp element because it's done by Michael Lark and he's really good at that kind of art. Um, I am referring to Gotham Central number 15, written by Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka, and here is the cover. Uh, the Joker posing for his mugshot, making faces for the camera, and it doesn't just remind me of the Joker, it doesn't just remind me of the man who laughs, it reminds me of like Howard Hawks, it's just so many cool references in this that I think are just really compelling, and for that reason I'm closing out this video with probably no one else's favorite Joker cover, but for me I think it's just really important to highlight something a little bit different, and hopefully someone will see this and go, yeah, that's right, we can take the Joker in different directions once in a while, and hopefully they do that. So, 
Gotham Central number 15, final cover. I had an absolute blast going through my comics. This was so much fun, so thanks to Bearded and Cole. I just think it's so cool that they do this every month, and I'm excited to have been able to participate this month. We'll see what the challenge is next month. Maybe I will again. If you stuck around to the end, thanks for watching. Leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll talk to you guys very soon. Hope you guys have a great week in comics, and thanks for watching.